Kia ora and welcome to No ME, the podcast video series where guest speakers talk about pressing issues surrounding myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, and long COVID. Join researchers, clinicians, and patient advocates as we take a deep dive into the most recent evidence-based information so that you too can know ME. ANSMES does not benefit from or receive any funds from any courses or products mentioned in this podcast episode. ANSMES does not provide medical advice directly to patients. Please always seek professional medical advice. This podcast is intended for health professionals seeking information on how to help patients with these conditions. In today's episode, we will discuss the lived experience. Wendy Matthews joins us to talk about her journey with severe ME, followed by a chat with Emily Tucky, who developed fibromyalgia as a teenager. So kia ora, Wendy, thank you for being here today. And I know it's very difficult to muster up the <laughs> cognitive function and energy to be here. And I realize that you're going to require uh, a lot of rest after this. So thank you so much for dedicating some time to us. Um, I'd love to start today if you would like to just share your story with us. Um, firstly, when did you become unwell and how long did it take to get a diagnosis? Good morning, Fiona. Um, it, it, I became unwell probably uh, 29 years ago. I was 39. I'm now 68, so, you know, I've had it for a long time. Um, and it probably only took about six months to get uh, the diagnosis once I became really quite unwell. Um, but th there were, um, it took longer than that to actually get a man management strategy in place and medication because the doctor that, diagnosed it or the diagnostician that actually diagnosed it after about uh, me being in hospital 10 days it really didn't know how to treat it or what to do um, and I mean they were very kind and they said we're really sorry this is what you've got but basically there's nothing we can do for you so it'll only last two years but go home get through the best you can and he wasn't being unkind but his suggestion was that I watch funny movies and drink orange juice to sort of help my immune system which um I th was was just the best he had to offer and, and he was just trying to be kind he, he didn't really have anything else to offer and once I got home I just continued to deteriorate and uh, an, another doctor suggested um that I go and see uh Roger Valens who was then acknowledged as the you know, authority on ME because she'd been involved um, at a major outbreak that was happened at the Royal Free Hospital. She was in a sister hospital at the time and it had a lot to do with the doctors and nurses that came through from that outbreak. So, um, and she had a keen interest in it and was uh, proactively trying to help people. And that was very good um, because she was able to at least pop me on some medication which really um, did dampen down the, the symptoms a lot and just made it easier to cope with and also um, mentioned such things as, um, as how best to get through it, you know, that I couldn't push myself. It was an actual biomedical illness um, it wasn't just something that was um, a result of me sort of um, being unwilling to try and make progress or, um, or opt out of life. It wasn't anything like that. It was that I was actually sick and my body just simply couldn't do the mm -hmm. things it used to. Anymore. Exactly. And so the diagnosis you received was one of MECFS from that first doctor um, or from, or was it from Roz herself? Um, she confirmed it, but it was after mm -hmm. they'd done the, you know, all those tests, which took about ten days. They they confirmed that that's what it was, but really they had nothing more to offer after that. Which you know, it was really mm -hmm. good to get a diagnosis because 
you don't know what's going on in your body if you don't have that diagnosis it's really scary um your family don't know what to say to people you don't know what to say to people you really need to have a diagnosis and i think that um it did make a difference for me to get that because one of my family members um after that asked uh, her doctor you know what sort of the treatment would be for for me and the um that doctor didn't understand me and and gave her um a um an answer that really wasn't helpful mm -hmm. and continued to um to actually make life a bit difficult for everybody until such a time as they too came to understand this was a physical illness and it was a result of um just not trying mm. yes i mean and we think yeah i mean your diagnosis was some 30 years ago so uh back then they were still a lot of them thinking about it being a having a psychological basis uh and you know we've had a lot more research since then of course that's um furthered the understanding of the disease so uh, if you don't mind sharing i mean what what was your life like just so our viewers and listeners can understand uh what was your life like pre-illness and what are you able to do now or during your illness journey how how has the illness fluctuated for you um pre-illness i was the sort of person that always did too much rather than too little um i was interested in everything and i uh, wanted to give everything a go i loved water skiing um going out in the boat i had a big family we had a bl blended family with seven children and um and when i got sick the youngest which who were twins were just six years old so life was really busy i just wanted to be a great mum have a lot of fun with my kids um i had the opportunity from time to time to go overseas uh, with my husband because he um his work took him overseas a lot occasionally i could go to other countries mm -hmm. uh, we lived in in la for three months uh, with his work for a wee while but, you know so my life was very full i loved painting gardening um just anything that was really outdoors and um and just full on you know i wasn't really one to sit around much i was always busy and um that was all came to a pretty dramatic sort of a halt uh pretty quickly when i got a flu and my uh, one of my eldest twin got the flu at the same time and she got over it i just didn't and i continued to um to get worse and i didn't have a clue what was happening um and of course mm. kept pushing myself because you know we had a big family i didn't know that i needed to mm. rest um so i just continued to go yeah. um down um interesting enough um down the track um I'd, I'd actually made progress so i had sort of had a relapsing remitting form of me and it took mm -hmm. a lot of years to make progress by you know taking things very slowly um and i had made progress over over some years to be able to sort of walk again and then drive again because i'd become bed bound you know after the first um in, in the first instance and that uh, took a, a lot of time to get back to walking and doing those things that was sort of over a number of years and i was never got back to 100 percent perhaps 60 percent or so of what i would have done previously and um was doing quite well and holding my own you know pacing and things until i got a, another flu and this time the younger twin and i both got this flu and she developed memory after that too and i relapsed incredibly and spent the next seven years in bed until i slowly mm. started to make progress again you know sort of from not being able to sit up to be able, able to turn actually turn over in bed and, and then sit up and then wait there and sort of one step two step very very slow if i pushed mm. it i just went backwards and 
as I've got the sort of personality that will push things. Um, so I had to work very hard against what came quite naturally to me. And she's she's still unwell too. She got it at 14. She's just turned 35. She's house and then mm. head down too. And it's, it's so difficult to see your own child go through that as well. You know, you want the best for your children uh, and to see them living a similar life to you is, is very difficult, I'm sure. Yeah, it does seem to be that a lot of people who develop ME have been filling, uh, living very busy, hectic lives. And then there is such a huge adjustment to get to that. It's essentially a trial and error process, isn't it? You have to try something and then see whether it triggers symptoms or not, and then bring yourself back to an activity that hopefully doesn't trigger it. Um, is that the kind of process that you went through over the years, Wendy? Yes, pretty much. And I think um, because I trained as a registered nurse, I think one of the things with nursing is that uh, you have to be observant and you very quickly uh, notice patterns and things. Mm -hmm. And it, it took a little while. In fact, my children noticed the pattern before I did. I think I was just too sick. But... Um, that as soon as I got a lot of energy, I would start to want to tidy and do things, you know. Um, and then I would, the next day, I'd just be a, a mess again. And, of course, the more I'd overdone it, um, the bigger the crash. And uh, somebody mm. said to me at one stage, you know, you're just unfit. You, you need to get well and uh, get get more fit. And... Um, and I thought, well, you know, perhaps I've got a point. And um, I knew I wasn't depressed. You know, that, that was the, the interesting thing. I knew I was sick, uh, not depressed, because I knew the difference between the two. And I still had dreams and plans. And, you know, I was lying there busy planning out the rest of my life, just waiting to get well. But it yeah. just didn't happen. Um, and uh, this person had uh, said to me, well, perhaps you're just unfit. And I thought, well, maybe they're right. So I forced myself out of bed and walked to the corner of the road. And when I got there, I thought, crumbs, I didn't know quite how I'm going to get back. So I rested there for half an hour and then really had to push it to get back um, and sort of collapse back in bed. And the post-exertional malaise just doesn't kick in straight away. Mm -hmm. And it kicked in the next day, and I was just so incredibly ill. It crashed me. I mean, I was bad enough how I was, but trying to do that just really, um, I think, really took away any chance at that stage of me um, making the progress that I had seen by resting before. Mm -hmm. um, Such a shame, isn't it? probably put me back two or three years yeah and and that's the the issue that we've had is that they they thought that it was deconditioning didn't they and then have discovered that no it's not um that there is this physiological dysfunction going on where exercise is actually hugely detrimental that because the energy production system isn't working you just, the body just simply doesn't have the fuel it needs to function. And if you're overexerting it, so if you're actually doing something incredibly physical, which healthy people don't really understand, right? That just walking down the street, they'll do that without even thinking. You know, we did when we were healthy. We didn't think about it. It was what we did, you know. Um, and But the mechanisms involved in getting your body to do that movement is – yeah, it's hugely detrimental uh, with this disease, unfortunately. I, I found it in the past, you know, it was like I didn't have to think about what I did. You know, as you say, everything just came naturally. You know, you thought, oh, I'll do this. You just did it. Now um, I have to weigh everything up that I do. You know, it's it's whether I, well you know I'm unable to shower at the moment I'm unable to get up to go to the loo so you know I'm, I'm reliant on uh, bedpans and um, you know things like that and that's really hard to lose your independence when I think you've been a terribly independent person and I was a very independent person 
and to have to change the whole way I think now to considering everything I do waiting until there's somebody there to help me do it is really hard um, so I've I've learned a lot along yeah. the way I've learned I just have to wait for things yeah. and I think that's one of the biggest things you learn in ME you just you can't have what you want now it takes time and it's not they're not looking at a day or a week sometimes not even a month sometimes it's years until we can you know get to where we want to be and um sometimes when we try and rush it it doesn't work and that's a huge mental adjustment for someone to come to terms with when you do have those hopes and dreams and you know an idea of how your life was supposed to pan out uh, and to have to I guess it's called acceptance isn't it come to terms with the fact that this is your reality now uh, and put things in place to to help you thrive in within your capacity at that given time so what kind of coping mechanisms and strategies have have worked for you what have you tried um i think one of the first things i had to learn to do was to say no um and that probably sounds you know a bit tough but um nobody could see what was going on with my body and how i felt um except me and no one could feel the changes that happened when i did push it because they were you know the symptoms that you get are so many and varied and it's mm. not just a little thing i mean it's really tough you can be trying to get through the next five minutes you know all through the day in fact i had a clock on my wall that i used to watch and think i i can get through the next five minutes you know i can get through the next five minutes it was just so intense and i wasn't doing that for a week or two i was doing that for months and months and months and I think when people say, you know, try this, try that, um, you're grateful because it's a form of caring that they offer and they want you to try these things. But when you've lived with this illness and you've seen the pattern, um, you just know what the payback will be. And you're the one that has to um, live with that payback, not anybody else. So I, I had to learn to say no, and it wasn't always popular when I said no <clears throat> so I had to learn uh, it was okay not to be popular it was okay if people didn't like um, the way I was doing things but I had to do that um, to give myself the best possible chance to get well and mm. you know even as you can imagine being a mum with a lot of kids it was very very hard to say no um, because my children were being looked after by other people and not to step in at times when I really wanted to, but I was too sick. I mean, I couldn't turn over from bed. I couldn't open my eyes for a lot of days. I couldn't listen to music. You know, sound for me was like um, a physical pain. If somebody slammed a door, mm. it was a, like a sharp pain going through my spine. I couldn't sleep. You know, all these things were going on and um, it was very physical. I had big, wide, flat sores that open up on my chest, and um, you know, and and there was a green liquid that ran out of my eyes. So you know, these are all such physical things. Um, but I was too ill to keep going back to the doctor, and mm. I had lost a little bit of confidence in in what the medical profession could do for me. So I had decided pretty much that my only option was to stay home and get through it the best I could any way I could. And if that was mm -hmm. saying no, that's how I had to do it. And eventually, I think people started to understand that's just how it would be. So that was the first thing I had to learn to do. And the other one was um, to, to, as soon as I started to feel well and, you know, I had all these ideas in my head, um, I couldn't go out and start doing them. I couldn't start tidying the house. I couldn't start putting even my room in order. I had to sort of build up mm -hmm. um, to a certain level, um, you know, so I was perhaps using only a, a tiny bit of what I'd gained to do things rather than using all of it. 
you know, because there was always the unexpected mm -hmm. that came and I had to have enough energy for that. So that was one coping mechanism. Um, when I had trouble breathing, I, I, and I got very short of breath, um, I, I used, you know, the slow breathing techniques. That was, that was handy. Um, and I've been fortunate that I've sort of had a fairly positive outlook always. So um, in those times when I couldn't open my eyes and I couldn't move in bed, I mean, there were times I couldn't even feed myself. I had to be fed. Um, I would just lie there and um, think of places I'd been or or plan what I was going to do when I get well. And I never stopped planning what I was going to do when I got well. You know, so I think if if it had been a mind over matter thing, I think... I possibly could have won it, but it, it wasn't. Yeah, exactly. Um, so during some of the symptoms that you were talking about and, and the severity, it sounds like you were in the very severe category for quite a few years. Um, what what severity category would you classify yourself as currently? I think I'd still be in the very severe Um mm -hmm. Because you know, I know there are others that are that are worse. Um, at the moment, I'm fortunate that I can actually do this podcast. I yeah. can interact a lot. Um, I'm better than I was, um, mm -hmm. but I would still be in that severe, that severe category, because I can't, I can't walk. Um, and if I try and read, the nausea gets so bad. Um, right. I just have to lie down because my head's spinning and I've got a constant low-grade migraine. Um, you know, all these things are going on. Um, but it's just, I really can't do anything for myself. I'm reliant on so many other people. Mm. Yes, and it's coming to terms with that as well, isn't it? To relying on people, losing that independence, but bring, making sure you have a good support system around you of people who are willing to help and who can help. Um, are you okay just to talk for a, a few more minutes? Um, how are you feeling? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Okay. Because um, I know you've been through the hospital system um, at various times, and I was just interested in, in knowing uh, about your experience with health professionals and how it's been in a hospital setting. I was actually really, really grateful Um the last, you know, for their help, the last three times that I was in hospital, um, the, this this over this year I've been in there three times, and and um, the first time was for a, for a month because I hadn't been able to tolerate food, um, and I'd gone down to thirty six k's, you know, I'm usually about fifty fifty five, and um, I just couldn't get the food in. I was just reacting to too much. Um, much as I tried, and even though I tried, you know, lots of different ways with the food, I just couldn't get it in. So I, I was dreading going to hospital because it, it's not quiet. Uh, it was mm -hmm. in the middle of COVID, and um, and I just, um, you know, didn't think it was was a great idea. But I was out of options. Um, but when I got there, I was absolutely blown away by the kindness of the nurses and the medical profession when I got there and um, things seem to have improved um, since I'd been there sort of some years ago and uh, there seemed to be a bit more understanding um, that there was an actual illness um, MECFS that it was biomedical and um, they they were really respectful in that they, if I um, felt I couldn't do something, they didn't push me to do it. They, they respected the boundaries that I had and the energy that I had. I mean, I tried to do everything I could because there's no point in going into hospital and not taking the advice. And, you know, I was out of options. Um, but I was really impressed and really grateful for, for how kind they were. That's um, wonderful. Yeah, it was was really good. I think I'd had experiences before um, where um, people hadn't understood, and it left me feeling really awful. And as if I uh, wasted people's time 
when in fact I was really sick and I really needed some help. So I got a lot of confidence back actually going in this last time. And um, yeah, it, it was actually was actually good. I was just very grateful. That's that's wonderful, and I guess that shows the transition over time in the uh, almost thirty years that you've been unwell. That the attitudes and perceptions and knowledge have changed in the health profession about what MECFS really is, which is great to see that it's uh, making progress in the hospital setting as well. Is there something um, specific that you would like health professionals to know about MECFS, given that these are the people that are listening and viewing our podcast, our GPs and nurses and allied health professionals? Is there something you'd like them to know? I, I think I just want them to know that, you know, most of, most of us are people that are really trying very hard. Um, most of us are people that have worked incredibly hard before we got sick. We don't choose to be this way. It's it, There's no payoff for us being sick. There absolutely isn't. <laughs> I mean, everything is waiting for me outside my bedroom door. It's not in here, I can promise you. Um, <laughs> But, um, I, and I think the other thing is just to believe the patient. I mean, some of our symptoms that we come up with are awfully bizarre. We don't understand them either. And it's like, you, you know, uh, it's embarrassing to even have to mention some of them because you can't figure them out yourself. Mm. But I think, I think I would just like them to listen mm. because, you know, for somebody such as myself who's lived with it for 29 years, I have learned something and even when I was in the hospital I, I just said to them you know what what do you know about ME and have you you know have you got anything to offer me and they said look we'd love to um, but to be quite honest um, no um, you probably have lived with it longer and have more understanding but I really appreciated their honesty mm. um, because you know they they want to help us we want to be able to work with them because that gives the best outcome and I think um, just the mutual respect I found in the hospital that mutual respect is so important that you know the patient's got a story to tell um, the patient's been through a lot um, and please just listen and work with them you could you can do quite a lot I think as a sort of a collaborative team because doctors have just got the knowledge that we don't, um, whereas we've got the lived experience that they, they haven't got. But um, and, and I think the other thing is, um, I know it takes a while to get a diagnosis and you've got to rule out a lot of things, but um, I kind of long for the day when I could um, go in and, and know that... Um, I suppose there was a diagnostic marker and, and would make everybody's job a lot easier because they could just say, you know, like with MS or something else, this is what you've got. But, um, you know, I can be given so many labels um, before I get an ME label that, you know, and the problem with that is that um, wrong label, wrong treatment, wrong mm. management, and you know that could make me and did actually make me a lot more sick before I got better and and please don't be frightened of giving the diagnosis because we need that diagnosis we need um you know I, I know you've got to rule everything else out but we really need that diagnosis if if you don't feel confident to make it um to get a second opinion or something because we can't move forward without it. Absolutely. That's empowering. Um, so you've been on the ANSME's executive committee for many years now. And uh, I know in the short time I've been there, um, you've contributed immensely um, at times when you've been really struggling uh, symptom wise. So I'm always very grateful for your input because you've got this wealth of knowledge. Um, what would you like government legislators to know about our condition? Well, I think I'd like them to just listen for a start and to be open to what we've been trying to tell them for a lot of years because um, we bring them the medical research, we bring them um, peer-reviewed 
research. There needs to be more, you know, we know, we don't have all the answers. It's a pretty big jigsaw puzzle, but you know, there are more pieces being put in all the time, but we're getting the same stock answers that we got 15 years ago. And so what we really need is for them to actually, again, collaborate with us, to listen to our stories. I, I just think um, if any of them came and spent a day or a week in our homes um, or with us, I think it wouldn't be so easy just to send that, that standard reply we seem to get. And uh, that's very frustrating because it's not just me. There are so many of us. This is not a rare illness. You know, yeah. and we're looking at a percentage now of having um, going on to get that diagnosis after having long COVID. Mm. You know, we're looking at young people whose whole lives are ahead of them, mm -hmm. um, hit down in the prime of life. A lot of these are very, very bright young people who have great futures in all sorts of areas, medicine everywhere. Um, and they're basically just being. Um, you know, mowed down by this illness. And if if the government would understand that, if they could sort something out with us now so that we could get, so that we could reach people early, early in the process, whether young or old, I mean, it's at peaks in teenage and in midlife, but um, if we could reach these people early, there's a chance they won't go on to become severe. There's a mm. chance that, you know, that earlier diagnosis can lead to a better prognosis. They, for us, are, well, they and the doctors, really, for us, are the fence at the top of the cliff. Mm. You know, if, if they recognise this early, if they put the right things in early, we're not going to tip over that edge and hit the bottom because once we go into free fall and we hit the bottom, there isn't any ambulance waiting for us. There's nothing there. And so many of us are simply falling through the cracks. And when they send us a statement that says, we already have this, this, this in place, um, you've got everything you need, and those of us with it are, are reading that saying, actually, we can't access this. Mm. There's a minute amount of us that are actually getting any help. This is not covering it, and this is not fit for purpose. Mm. And the whole thing needs to be re-looked at. Um, but if we keep getting these kind of um, cut and paste answers, we, we actually can't move forward. And yeah. and the government, I mean, it, it look, looks an expensive process to try and work with us and to help us right at the beginning when, you know, before we become severe or whenever, which is quite hard to turn around. They've got an option of getting in there and letting these young people have a life, you know, letting all of us um, contribute in the ways we want to contribute. Because, you know, we've, we've all trying really hard to do what we, we can. I mean, just because I'm, I'm ill doesn't mean that I've stopped trying to contribute to society and do things. Um, and that's, I guess, one of the coping mechanisms for me is that um, I've got to keep thinking outside my room and outside my illness. Mm. Um, if they put the right supports in place, you know, we could um, we could all be contributing and, and doing all these things a far better way, but they need to listen and they're not hearing what we're saying. You know, they but it's like it just bounces off the walls. You know, we send these things in and bounce back but they have to engage with us they have to listen and they have to understand i think if they really understood they wouldn't be quite so quick to dismiss us you know we, we need that that um to be put in the disability category it, it, it's the, the bar is too high for so many of us under that chronic long-term illness it's inaccessible yeah. and it's and um the help is so patchy around the country you know, so many um, people that I know are with ME are uh, just through working with a lot of them. 
you know, some are struggling even to give themselves a meal a day. Mm. And and the home help isn't available. They 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 might cook up a pot or something every two days and live on that for two days. They've got children putting pies into ovens and they're living on that, you know, six year olds because there's no help. You know, the, this is New Zealand. This is you know, we're not living in some backward country, but it feels like it at times. Yeah, there's no excuse in this country to not uh, help the most vulnerable. We, we have the capacity um, and it is just about getting to the right people and getting them to really truly understand. And maybe that's something that the health professionals can help us with as well as they learn and they have that rep reputation and that credibility to go to the legislators and say, look, this condition is serious. It is disabling. This is what these people need, our patients need. Let's do something about it. Absolutely. And money for research, because, you know, without that research, we can't progress. Um, but mm -hmm. I've, I've been thrilled to see uh, more doctors coming on board, um, mm -hmm. writing articles, mm -hmm. you know, um, and Professor Tate, for example, with the research he's done, which is just, um, well, it's putting New Zealand on the map. It's really good for New Zealand yes. to see, see that research coming out. Um, and these people are all happy to, to, to contribute, and I, I, I'm so grateful they do. Um, but they need to, you know, it needs to go f further than just um, sharing these stories all the time. We have to, but we need to see concrete changes. You know, we don't want to be sharing these stories forever. We no. want concrete changes. We want to be able to That's say, it. hey, this is so good now, you know? Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Wendy, for your time. I really appreciate it. And it's been a really interesting conversation. And I hope for our viewers and listeners, just gives them that little bit more insight into the lived experience for people with ME. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Fiona.